Acute dystonic reactions are one of the things that we think of in emergency psychiatry. The definition of acute dystonic reaction is that it's a sudden, sustained, involuntary muscle spasm anywhere in the body in response to an antipsychotic medication. It can occur in any muscle group, but the most common places are small muscles in the head and neck area. And some of these are so common that they have their own names. Muscle cramp in the eyes, an oculogyric crisis in which gaze is deviated in a particular direction and usually way out at the extreme of how far they can move by the nature of the muscle cramping. Cramp in the neck muscles called torticollis, usually represented by the chin being twisted clear over to where it's touching a shoulder. And it's quite scary and painful, as all of these are. The most dangerous of them, however, is a spasm of the throat. People feel like they're going to choke. Laryngospasm is, in fact, a possibility, and so there is a medical danger here. It's quite rare, but it does occur. Jaw cramping, trismus, has been described and also can occur. These aren't the only places where things happen. One can get cramping in any of the extremities. Back muscles are fairly common, occasionally abdominal muscles, and one shouldn't assume that it's going to be in one place versus another. As we look at the risk factors, class of medication is at the top of the list. About a 20 to 40 percent risk of this occurring with first generation antipsychotic. That's an incredibly high risk compared with the others. The lower potency first-generation antipsychotics, chlorpromazine, for example, or thioridazine, are less likely to occur this, but all of them still more likely than the second-generation drugs. Even with the highest risk of the second-generation drugs, risperidone and paloperidone, acute dystonic reactions are relatively rare. The others, but I've just listed some, there are are some additional second-generation drugs that would fit on this list at this point. The acute dystonic reactions are quite rare, but shouldn't be ruled out if you see someone having cramping. They have not been reported with quetiapine or clozapine, and so one would not expect these things to be seen with these drugs. Other risk factors to consider are time and dose. The large majority, about 90% of these reactions occur either in the first four days of treatment or after first four days after um, an increase in dose. You can see people that have been maintained for a long time on a lower dose of medicine who, if the dose is increased by a large amount, suddenly go into a period of higher risk. And so you can see this during those times. Generally, it's a time when there's a rapid escalation of dose, as well as being early in treatment. The most interesting thing that we see in the timing of the reaction is that the, the reactions are most likely to occur during a trough serum level, not during the high level, the peak level that would follow a dose. This is why when we'd be rounding on our inpatient unit, we do this first thing in the morning before the morning medications were given out. Some of the less experienced staff would sometimes think that this was uh, malingering on the part of our patients, claiming to have one of these reactions to avoid getting more of the antipsychotic. Can't rule that out, but uh, in fact, most of the time, it was simply that they were at the trough level of the medication. Patient risk factors, larger muscle mass. It's not clear if they actually have more cramping or if the cramping is simply harder to control with uh, the large muscle mass. This is a centrally mediated phenomenon. It's not occurring at the level of the muscles, but this was a, a risk factor we observed. Younger patients and male patients are more likely to have the acute dystonic reaction than women or older patients. The usual rule with older female patients, this is where you want to start low and go slow and you get some young buffed out man it's otherwise healthy and you think you just blast them with whatever medication you want, it's going to be okay. Just the opposite is true in the case of acute dystonic reactions. The older female patients tolerate the medications better than the younger otherwise healthy medications. There's some studies that have indicated that patients uh, with um, Asian genetics may be more likely to experience an acute dystonic reaction that uh, hasn't been as systematically studied as it might be. In making the diagnosis, you want to look for the overall setting in which the, the cramping is occurring. So you're going to expect that it's relatively early in treatment or after a change in treatment. The onset is going to be rapid. Generally, these cramps occur very quickly rather than over a long period of time. Certainly, they would be likely to occur within one day rather than over weeks. They tend to be localized. This is critical. They tend to be localized to one or just a few muscles, generally in the same area. 
And that's rather than a generalized rigidity, and that's going to be one of the key diagnostic features. Other things to look for, no alteration in consciousness, no alteration in vital signs. Now, these last three items are to distinguish an acute dystonic reaction from neuroleptic malignant syndrome, a far more serious and dangerous disorder that requires discontinuation of the medication over a substantial period of time and monitoring in an intensive care unit. Acute dystonic reactions do not require that level of care. Treatment is straightforward. Injectable benztropine or trihexafenadil. Uh, right now, benztropine is usually going to be a little bit more available in most hospital settings, but either one of these medications is perfectly appropriate as an anticholinergic. Benztropine 2 milligrams, trihexafenadryl 5 milligrams can be given at intervals from 15 to 30 minutes, and in each case up to four doses can be given safely. One expects to see a response within minutes of the injection. So at 15 minutes, it is reasonable to expect to have seen some response. At 30 minutes, you're probably seeing about as much as you're going to see with that dose. And if things haven't cleared up substantially, then another dose is appropriate. The average number of doses that's given with these medications is two, but you know you can give up to four and, and may still see a response at that point. Second option for acute treatment is an antihistamine, and uh, the one that's most commonly used is uh, diphenhydramine, which uh, is also anticholinergic, and so you want to be a little bit cautious using these together. This particular antihistamine together with the anticholinergics, but 50 milligram doses I am again at intervals of 15 to 30 minutes, and up to four doses can be used. Not listed here, but some other secondary treatments that can be used to at least relax the muscles, not necessarily addressing what's going on centrally, but to relax the muscles would be a benzodiazepine or a muscle relaxant, but those would clearly be second-line agents. The anticholinergics or antihistamine are generally going to control things pretty well. After this occurs, you're probably going to want to implement maintenance treatment. And so the same medications can be used at somewhat lower dose range, one or two milligrams of benztropine every six hours, up to a maximum of, of eight milligrams a day, trihexafenadyl, same thing, two to five milligrams every six hours, up to 20 milligrams a day. So again, maximum six-hour dosing will be effective at heading this off. It does come with the side effects that go with anticholinergic medications. So we don't always want to do this prophylactically. But if a patient's had an acute reaction, then it's a good idea to have this medication on board. Other alternatives, diphenhydramine, 25 to 50 milligrams every six hours, or a dopaminergic agent such as amantadine at 100 milligrams every six to eight hours, up to 300 milligrams a day, would all be reasonable options. Other treatment considerations, reduce the medication dose. You're almost certainly going to want to do that. Slow down the rate of titration. Consider an alternative medication. Be aware that acute dystonic reactions are class effects, not individual medicine effects. It is not appropriate to tell a patient that they're allergic to a particular medication because they had an acute dystonic reaction. In fact, they are prone to acute dystonic reactions, and they're going to be prone to those reactions with any medication that's comparable on the list of risk. What we should say is that with this class of medicines, the reaction is at higher risk. So consider an alternative class, a lower risk medication, and consider gradually decreasing, or rather be aware that the risk is gradually decreasing with time and that the patient may well tolerate a medication later that they had a reaction with early in treatment. So the take-home points here, acute dystonic reactions are associated with antipsychotics and especially with high-potency first-generation antipsychotics, especially early in treatment. The drugs to use to address the acute dystonic reaction are the anticholinergics, benztropine or trihexafenadyl, or the antihistamine, diphenhydramine. Uh, the responses to these medicines tend to be brisk and very effective.